Ready? Me, everyone. I truly don't need a mic. I think I have a big enough. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, you can. I just want to uh, take the time to thank each and every one of you who found that robbery to come and celebrate with Lady Tiffany, the dreamer. Wow, how many of you out there have dreams? How many of you have dreams? Any of you out there have dreams? You have dreams, things that you want to become? Well, it all starts with a dream, and I'm really so excited uh, for Lady Tiffany for uh, sharing her dreams with us this evening. And we want to take a moment to especially thank Tom Casey. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here at the Huntington Green Library. I mean, the place is gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. And before we bring on Lady Tiffany to share her dreams with you, we're going to start with another phenomenal person and that person is John Manny. He is also um, he's a Bronx writing instructor and uh, I understand that he is going to blow us away. I've never gotten a chance to hear him so I'm excited so let's welcome him to the mic John Manny. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This has uh, been a journey for Tiffany, and I, I've read her book with some amazing poetry in there, so I think you're going to enjoy listening to what she has to, she has to say. Um, how much do I, I have like three poems probably. Um, and Tiffany has been my, I teach writing, and I met Tiffany in one of my um, workshops here at Huntington Free Library not long ago. And uh, that's when I got to know her, and, and uh, this place has been amazing, Tom. Thank you for having us here, sure. Um, so um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Cedar Chest. In our basement was Grandma's cheap cedar chest, packed with memories, folded neat, watched over by her glass side, furry fox stoves. There were silver dishes, silk stockings, pictures with friends, young and free, news clippings, dresses that no longer fit in her life at the nursing home. She relived her youth daily, did not recognize people, thought me my father as a little boy, did not know him as a man. It hurt my father to see her mind going. She died young and free. As my years approach my memory of hers, I think there's something to be said about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The next poem I'd like to read is called um, Summer Lake. Standing near the window, I watch my wife sleep. Bare breasts rise and fall, moonlight tracing her face. There is wisdom in this. We become bent willows, swaying in the lake breeze. Shadows at our secret on bedroom walls, there is wisdom in this. Broken frogs, cicada cries, replace honking horns. August city left behind, we recharge, unwind, heal our broken lives. There is wisdom in this. Mm. <laughs> I'd like to read thoughts sunlight. I in the Andes, Imar Inca, Inca people lift their hands up, fingers spread to the summer solstice, sunrise. Warm blood covers their palms. Two llamas sacrificed. Worshippers gave from what letter they had. 
The sun gave these dhammas light. They returned it with thanks and prayers. In ancient Timet, Pharaoh Akhmedi believed that God showed humans the way through the sun. Its warmth is free, its light available for all who can see the way he loved his people. Sometimes, when I lay in summer grass, watching clouds pass, sun rays dancing between them, I see what Akhenaten saw. When light sparkles on waves of the nearby lake, I see through his eyes. When I return home to water my plants, I notice their leaves have turned towards the open window, reaching for the sunlight. I lift my hands, fingers spread. I am in the Andes, saying thank you, ready to sacrifice, wanting to love like the sun. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> John, I didn't know I needed to bring uh, stuff. You feel like Kleenex? I mean, you're about to just start gushing in cheers. Oh my God. Good thing I'm not wearing makeup. <laughs> well, for you, maybe. <laughs> it's not, I don't know. Okay, well, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to read uh, from two of the books uh, that I have written. This is the latest one, it's called Good News Buster which will also be available after you purchase The Dreamer. <laughs> so if you only have enough money to purchase one, then you got to get The Dreamer and let the OC hack sit by the side. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is actually uh, nonfiction. I love to write stories about people that I meet. So, you know, some of you sit and hear all these wonderful people. You may be in the next book, so you'll have to buy it to find out. Good news one. There was no doubt now. I was born to share the good news. I just wasn't sure how. It was in Sumter, South Carolina, on the 26th Sabbath of the year 1939, that I was born into this world. The times were both good and bad. Slavery had ended, but riding on its heels were the Great Depression and World War II making jobs even harder to find for people of color. And since Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, and Franklin D. Roosevelt, our 32nd president, singly helped people of color, I was given the name Roosevelt Johnson at birth. Roosevelt was an honorable name indeed, yet for some reason, mama started calling me Buster. Buster was a catchy nickname which caught on instantaneously among my family and, you know, my childhood friends. And eventually I too favored the nickname because it made me feel extra bold and determined. Buster, can you see it? Buster defies racism, poverty, and anything else the South delivered. Well, initially the thought of me busting down walls was somewhat comical because both of my paternal and maternal grandfathers were, you know, Baptist preachers in South Carolina. Dad's father was Anthony Johnson. We called him Papa Johnson. Papa Johnson was a resourceful preacher who built his church from the ground up using wood chopped from trees on his own land. His church was called Wilson Grove Baptist Church. Mama's dad was James Brown. Not to be mixed with the dancer, not him. And we called him Papa Papa Brown. I don't recall if he built anything, but his church was called Jordan Chapel. Going to church was a delight. It enveloped my childhood, and I loved it. When we went to church, I sat close to the pulpit so I could see and hear everything. I took in every word as I watched my grandfathers open the holy book and proclaim the message of the Lord. As I listened, I imagined how one day I would do the same. 
In addition to the spoken word capturing my attention, there was Richard Johnson, my dad. He had an a cappella gospel group that sang at my grandfather's churches and often conducted the rehearsals at our home. This was always a special treat for my siblings and I because dad was a self-made businessman who often spent long hours away from home. Church folk loved when dad's group sang. Dad was the group's time-keeping and melodious bass singer. Boy, could he move the room with his low, low, low notes. And when dad's group sang, some people clapped their hands, some people tapped their feet, and some folk added to the joyous sound with the scraping of a wire on a washboard. The words of the songs that they sang resounded the good news of God from east to west and from north to south. And when folk listened, they somehow knew that God's love and grace would help them in good times and bad times. I knew that as I tapped my, fall, my small feet and clapped my small hands that I too would have a gospel group one day. And when God called me in the beginning, I'd be somewhere listening for my name. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know he's the presence of I was invisible 
and there was no escape. That evening, voices in the darkness called out to me. They plagued me. Was I crazy? That girl, 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 girl. Hey, dirty girl. The voices were so loud that I didn't know if it was my imagination, a dream, or spirits in the room. Whatever it was, I wasn't going to sleep in the dark anymore. Mm -mm. If mother turned the light off, I waited for her to leave, and I turned it back on. Eventually, dad realized I was turning the light back on. Suspecting something was wrong, he sat down on the side of my bed. What's wrong, Joyce? He asked as he sat in my bed. Nothing. I like it. What are you afraid of? He continued to inquire. At first, I didn't want to tell him about the voices in the dark, but eventually, I confided in him. Don't listen to them, he said. You are my black princess. Daddy was my hero. I was so glad that I told him about the taunting. From then on, he would remind me every night that I, I was his black princess. And this encouraged me because Daddy was the most handsome man in the whole world. Knowing that I was his black princess meant that the voices in the darkness no longer mattered. I didn't have to be afraid. Mm. So as you have heard from the writings reflected from John and from myself. Writing is a way to express the most intimate places of our heart. Sometimes things that we can't even verbalize, but if we put it down on paper, somehow we can separate it from ourselves. And tonight, I have the pleasure to introduce to some of you and present to those who know her a phenomenal woman. A phenomenal, phenomenal woman. To some, she's mom, god mommy, sister. To she, to me, she's my crazy, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> my crazy bone. <laughs> but to the world, she is a speaker, she's a singer, she's an entertainer, she's the dreamer. I would like to present to you Lady uh, thank you guys. Thank you so much to all of you who are here. It really means a lot to me. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me without this mic? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it was me. Anyway. <laughs> So, um, yeah, this has been a journey. Um, I first want to give thank you so much to the Huntsville Free Library for giving me this day in the venue. Thank you, Tom Casey. Thank you, John. It all started here. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> so, um, just my gratitude to, to you guys. Um, and so, like, as my sister was just saying about writing intimate is the very intimate thing. So this was a process for me. And someone asked me the other day about well when did how long did it take you to write the book? And I said, all my life. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> because every um piece in here was a, was something that had to be processed in order for me to capture it enough to put it down. And to share it with you means a lot to me and I'm so thankful that you're here, so I'm going to start. The first one I'm going to read to you is The Dreamer. <laughs> you may call me a dreamer. So what if it is true? My dreams gave me peace of mind when there was none to find. My dreams have seen me through heartaches, hopeless moments of despair, stood by my side, when no one else cared. My dreams have let me breath when I was too weak to take one on my own. Oh, how my dreams have matured and grown. I'm proud of my dreams because they belong to me and me alone. So close to my heart, 
pressed against my soul, showing me the light of my fate so I can gain control of my destiny as I stroll down this illusion of reality. My dreams don't invite the company of pain, suffering, self-pity, or fear. My dreams are always near. My dreams have their own soul, spirit, and heartbeat. My dreams are so very gentle. My dreams keep me going on, inspiring me to create and sing my life's love songs. I nurture them with my deeds as I plant crops of love seeds. And one by one, day by day, they come to life. My dreams are truly the best part of me. So call me a dreamer, for it is true. And I'm happy to share my dreams with you. So, um, I'm making a selection. So this one is called Beauty Is. Because I believe that every that God creates us all have a unique sense of expression and beauty. And um, a lot of times people may say, they'll look at your outer appearance and they'll say, oh, she's beautiful, or she's this, having no idea what all of this entails, what what the curse of beauty is, <laughs> what, what the different traps of beauty is. But I was blessed because God created me to always look beyond the surface. And so um, this, this inspired this poem, <laughs> Beauty Is. Beauty can never fade within, for it is much deeper than the surface of the skin. Despite, one, despite one's own features, we are all God's creatures. The spirit lives deep in one's soul, where beauty is knowing love so intimately you Beauty is not just a face or body. It's much more than what you can see. Beauty lives in you and me. For beauty is love unmatched, shining through your soul, touching another wholeheartedly. Beauty is the best of you and me. Yes, everything sweet, gentle, and kind. Beauty is a state of mind. Once you get to know the love that lives within you, it will shine through. Yes, believe this your beauty to be true. Beauty lives inside of you. Okay, so um, this is a poem called "I Know What It's Like," and it's a journey. <laughs> it's a conglomeration of different experiences throughout my life, and for some reason, it all came together in this one piece. Uh, you know, brace yourself, it's not always pretty, but my saying is, you know, life is not always pretty, but it is beautiful. <laughs> That's true. So, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to have your innocence stolen way too soon. It's like total darkness, no stars, no moon. I know what it's like to be abandoned by the man who helped create me. Never thinking to come by, call, or even take me. I know what it's like to feel victimized as a child by other children you want to befriend, yet they display hateful actions and tease you for no apparent reason. The loneliness a fragile heart goes through in such a delicate, rocky, and stormy season. I know what it feels like after all the emotional pain and turbulent times to dare and believe in love again. You open up your heart to people because you need to feel appreciated, protected, and, and appreciated and protected. Then betrayals take place, and all you feel is neglected, disrespected, and rejected. I know what it feels like to be misunderstood by someone you gave your whole heart to and have it ripped apart with suspicion and accusations that are all lies. Yet still try to be submissive to them in, in time. Praying that God will change the situation so true love can shine. I know what it feels like to be talked down to and degraded and told you are nothing so many times that you start to feel that way inside, to be hit so hard you feel despised and get harder because you appear to be resisting. Hoping against hope that if you love them and be a better person, they'll see the real you and change to be more loving, gentle, caring, and understanding 
instead of lustful, distrustful, abusive, disloyal, and demanding. But after all that I've been through, I thank God now, through and through, because if not for these situations, I could have not helped another, someone else's devastation. So, this one is called A Gift to My Friend. I can feel the presence of a higher purpose leading me to and away from false ideas. I am flying like an eagle on a journey in my soul. I am growing like a naive child, yet so bold. I'm embracing all I don't know with the determination to learn. I am living out my desires as I dream for what I yearn. I am letting go and receiving from myself what no one else can give. Jumping into the emptiness to find the things one cannot see. I am having faith and love when it seems to bring despair. I am embracing heartache to find joy in its touch. I am leaving behind all I knew and loved so much. Off on an unknown journey into darkness so I can find the light within, forgiving all of me to begin again. I am building a solid foundation for each illusion that I find, strengthening my character, empowering my peace of mind by being true to my moment each day, minute, and second in time, opening my heart to a love I always knew could be mine. I'm giving the gift of honor, respect, and dignity to myself as I let go of me and finally set myself free. So, um, I'm gonna read one more. <laughs> This is called My Loneliness. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> my loneliness. My loneliness is not a sad cry I wish for many to hear. For me, it's a celebration of my soul, which chooses on her own to strive to be the best in God, business, family, and friendship. My loneliness is a parade of greatness, guiding me through the darkness of my insecurity. For I am but a soldier, fighting an inner war to be as honest with myself as to this mission of life. My loneliness and I are faithful to one another. We talk, we laugh, we cry, and we watch together witnessing relationships of friends. My loneliness and I move on smoothly as the music plays a harmonious tune for me to dance in joy and peace and in love despite betrayals. Sometimes my loneliness and I spend time looking into sorrow's eyes, finding the peace in our own existence. In the words of, uh, uh, What's his name? Uh, CD1. Is <laughs> so at this time, we want to open up uh, for questions. For the author, any questions? <laughs> Come on. Yes. What was your writing process like? What was my writing process like? It was uh, daunting, beautiful, uh, a barrier of different emotions because like I said this is um, they asked me how long it took me to write the book I said my whole life because this has been a process to be able to break down these emotional um, challenges that I've had and the different situations and traumas and different things that I've gone through but also determined that I was not going to let that define who I was and so it, it was a process of some days I felt like Hey, I'm great. Sometimes I felt like not so great. So, 
and I was just fighting through each of it, each step. So it was the artist journey, but it was beautiful. <laughs> yes. Um, I heard that you used uh, used to write poetry and sold them down in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Like, so tell us about it because I thought it was very interesting. <laughs> um, I well, when I um, I was I, I've been writing ever since I picked up a pen. Honestly, that's like uh, when I grew up. Since I was little, I always just loved writing. But as I developed and I started to go out on um, adventure, that was one of my adventures, going out to the village in Soho and different places and hanging up my poetry in the street and selling it, you know, and just, you know, I was doing it to spread love and also make some money because it was like, I was a single mom and I needed, you know, to have, you know, to make ends meet. But I also didn't want to sacrifice my art and, um, who I really was. So it was a beautiful experience. I used to love doing it. Sometimes it was a little bit challenging because my daughter was little, sometimes she would run in the street. I had to give her her first spanking, but <laughs> but yeah. But it's been, you know, yeah, I, I did do that. It was it was fun for a long time. Yeah. And I heard you also do art, art besides poetry. Tell us about um, it. <laughs> I do photography, I sing, um, I do um, and like voice, voice um, acting. Would you mind singing something? Oh, oh no, you did! <laughs> Get in the spirit. <laughs> All right now. Get in the spirit because this is this is a joyful day for me to be able to sing to to um, God and and for all of you. Um, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for. To be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living you. Questions? Any other questions? What are you working on next? More poetry? Oh yes, I just did my poetry. <laughs> I'm working on um, just growing and finding out what what moves that God wants me to take next. But you know, just enjoying the journey, learning to uh, enjoy the journey is a real big deal for me now. Um, it's not about getting to a destination or trying to accomplish something to feel. Better. It's about enjoying that. He's already gave me just this moment, just right now, just to enjoy you people, and you, hopefully you're enjoying you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and continue to grow and try to inspire as many people as I could. Thank you. So with that in mind. We are now going to unveil. Please sign up for the program. We vibrate booking when we face. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, while Lady Tiffany goes uh, to her seat, uh, please go and support her and uh, support her dreams. Her books, she's there with her books. They're available for $10 and she will autograph it for you. Also, there's a backdrop for the Huntington Library. You were here. We want you to come in and there's some food and cheese and our drinks there. Please come and just mingle and thank you so much for being a part of Tiffany's dream. Oh, and please make sure you sign the book up front so that they know that you were here. Thank you so much.